Josh Pate here from 24-7 Sports. The Social Distance Series continues. we got Nashville country music recording artist Travis Denning with us today. And Travis, it is a very, very big week for you. you got some stuff going on we're about to talk about. But before we get to that, we got to get the obligatory, how's life been for you the last couple of months question out of the way? Man, it's crazy. You know, it's going. Um, you know, I'm kind of praying and hoping every day that we can get back on the road as soon as possible. But, you know, I understand the situation we're in. So, trying to take advantage of this time to, you know, soak in some of the things in life that I don't normally get to. So I've been fishing a lot and uh, drinking beer earlier in the day than I ever have in my life. You know, just th those little things that you usually do on vacation. So um, still writing songs and just trying to keep the wheels moving, man, no matter what it is. After a few, which is your current single, I mean, it's been doing something on the charts lately. And this is a big week for you, I mentioned, because you got your debut EP dropping later this week, depending on when you're listening to this. Now, we're recording this, and this thing's coming out Friday. So is it more hectic, less hectic, because you can't be out there promoting like you normally would be, I'd imagine? It's like the same amount of hectic, just a different kind of perspective on it. Now, I've been staring at my computer, you know, and doing a ton of interviews, ton of phone calls. Uh, and we're actually gearing up for tomorrow. We're going to have, or Thursday, uh, we're going to have a full band live stream event, which is going to be amazing. Uh, I'm fired up for that. So, yeah, man, uh, it's crazy hectic. I'm just not traveling. <laughs> you mentioned uh, writing a lot. I would imagine, I mean, if you're a creator, if you're an artist, and you have extra time to just sit around, you always look back five years after something terrible happens and a lot of great art <clears throat> has come out of something terrible. So, I mean, is that going to be the way it is for you two, three years from now when you're a couple albums in and you're sitting number one on all the charts, are we going to look at a single and say, you know, that's that COVID song right there. I remember exactly <laughs> when I wrote that one. Yeah, man. I mean, dude, I've already written, <clears throat> I mean, I've been writing a lot. So I've already got two songs that have like, they've been in the back of my head every single day, like that I'm super fired up about. Um, and yeah, man, I think for me, it's just, I've been so focused on it. You know I mean? What else am I going to do but write songs and, you know, try and be laser focused with my friends on zoom and whatever we're writing on. And I think that's really helped, you know, whether it's kind of a introspective look, whether it's a different perspective or it's the same old kind of ratty party song that we all know and love. I just feel like there's a, there's kind of a notch up on the focus, uh, during all this time that's really helped me and a lot of other people you've um you've you've already in a very limited amount of time relative to someone who's been on the scene 30 or 40 years you've toured with some big acts you've opened for some big acts you've been shoulder to shoulder with some really big names tell me about maybe a venue that you've played that's been surreal or a person or two maybe a band that you've shared the stage with that's been kind of that pinch me moment Man, I mean, the, the venue that comes to mind for me, I mean, it's, it's still the Ryman Auditorium. I, I've been so lucky that I, I've played there like seven or eight times now. And that is just, I don't know, you dream of playing the Ryman when you come to Nashville. I mean, it's so historical. And I've been lucky enough to be there several times. As far as an artist that I've shared the stage with, that's just an amazing moment was I opened up for Alan Jackson um in Rockford Illinois actually the day that my first single came out like my first single ever and man just to get up there there's like 10,000 people uh we closed our set with whipping post by the Almond Brothers band which just was like looking back I'm like I don't know why but we did and it was awesome you know it was like whatever let's 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 show them where we come from a little bit and uh man just watching Alan get up there just hit after hit after hit uh, it was just a really cool moment, you know, my first song coming out and watching him, it was kind of like, all right, that's where, that's where you want to be one day. You know, you just got to open up for him. So how are we going to grind and get to that point? And uh, it was just a cool little stamp and a nice little moment uh, at the beginning of my career. You're from Warner Robins. That's just south of Macon. I'm from Fortson, which is just north of Columbus. We're both central Georgia guys. You're just central central. I'm west central. But you yeah, mentioned yeah. the Allman Brothers, man. If you're like me, you just grew up driving around singing Almond Brothers songs all the time. So absolutely, that's about as far as most people get in their singing career. What's it like to go from singing to the steering wheel a thousand times one song to covering it on stage in front of ten thousand people? It's it's wild, man. I mean, I will say, like, in in a moment when I do something like that, I mean, we always try to play the Almond Brothers live because, like you said, it's like it is just a 
the fastest connection for me to get back home in my mind is, is to play an Owen Brothers song. But man, it's cool. It's a little, it's a moment that I feel like for a lot of people in the crowd, I'm kind of showing them like, hey, this is like where I come from. And I hope they like connect the dots when they hear us cover Whipping Post or Ramblin' Man or whatever it is. And then they go, oh yeah. And they hear after a few and they're like, I got it. I see where he's coming from, you know? So for me, it's always a cool moment. I feel like I got 10,000 people and I'm going, hey, listen to this really cool song I grew up with. And it, it, it's a cool moment. And uh, I, I always love getting that chance. I remember, you know, being from Georgia, <clears throat> like both of us are, you know about big venues. You mentioned the Ryman. Everybody knows the big arenas and the big cities. But there are these small towns like Albany, and you mentioned Warner Robins, Macon, Milledgeville, all these places. I remember a decade ago, me and my buddies would load up and haul off to like the Georgia Theater in Athens and yeah. we'd see some dude that not many people had heard of named Luke Bryan because that's when he was coming up. So I'm very curious, as you get your start in Georgia, what was your touring scene like? What places did you play? Like, how did you get your name out there? Man, I, literally everything you just said, dude. I mean, uh, the Georgia Theater was like the mecca for, mm -hmm. for somebody growing up in Georgia. If you got to play there, then you were, you know, you were, you were doing something right. So I've played the 40 Watt a lot in um, Athens. Uh, we've been lucky to play the Georgia Theater a few times. Uh, in Milledgeville, uh, there was a place called Capital City that a couple of my buddies owned. It was a rowdy place. We used to play there. Dude, in Columbus, uh, The Loft. Yep. A great venue in Columbus. I mean, dude, everywhere. We, we burned up every small town in Georgia you could find. We played Valdosta a lot, Tifton a lot. Uh, so, yeah, for me, man, it was like I wanted to just go play everywhere in my home state and get, like, an understanding – of like what's going on what's a good venue what's a great place who's got a rowdy crowd and dude every one of those little places has its own personality and, and this kind of expectation of who's going to come to those shows so we did from the age of probably 19 to 21 I bet I was playing every single weekend somewhere in Georgia do you ever um do you have like documented recordings of your early performances and if so do you ever watch 19 year old Travis Denning back and then critique him like you would a football coach at a football game Oh, oh, totally, dude. I've got – not only do I have some video, but I've got some, like, board tape recordings of whole shows, like the entire show. And it's – I had to get a couple of drinks in me before I listen to that. <laughs> dude, it makes me so uncomfortable because, you know, for me, it's like you said. It's like a football coach. I'm hearing, dude, I'm like, Travis, you, you're taking way too much time in between songs. What are you doing? Like, why are you, why are you telling the monitor guy to turn up your vocal? It's like I'm going, you're so unprofessional. But, but dude, it's like – it playing on stage, writing songs, singing, it's all muscle. It has to be worked out and you have to, you have to constantly grind through it to get better. So I just kind of chalk it up as like, it was a learning process. Here's what's awesome though. No one makes it without support and without a full support system. And I mean, in my line of work, I'll go back and watch my old stuff and think it sucks. You may go watch yourself perform from eight years ago and you think it sucks, but yet there are folks who are behind you today that were supporting you just as much then. And you think to yourself, man, if they would support this, then I know I can count on them now. Uh, dude, a hundred percent, man. And obviously the first, the first group of people I think of is my parents, <clears throat> you know, during that. I mean, a lot of parents, when their kid comes home from one semester of school, they, uh, and says, Hey, I want to bail and I want to save up money. I want to move to Nashville. They're probably thinking like this kid's lost his mind, but they just, my my mom's biggest thing was she just wanted me to have a plan and she wanted me to stick with it. And that's what I did. And, um, you know, I got to Nashville. Uh, one of the first people I met was a guy named Jeremy Stover, another Georgia boy. He's from LJ, Georgia. And, um, and he, I mean, he is my producer today. He's my publisher. And he's just, he was the first guy to look at me and go, you know, if you want to go do this and you want to be an artist, and you want to have hits, he's like, I'm telling you right now, I think you can do that and we can, we can do it together. So you're right, man, looking back and you hear old songs and all this stuff, you think, oh my God, who, who would give me a publishing deal back then? I mean, let alone take me out for lunch, you know, and uh, those were the people who did. And that's why you, you stick with them because they just believed in you even when you couldn't see it. And that's important. There's some people, if you grew up in Georgia, 
some people, even though they're from Georgia, they kind of want to feel intellectually superior when they walk into the room. So everyone else in the room will be a Georgia Bulldog fan. And they'll say, I pull for Oregon. Or, I mean, you know, I like Ohio State. That's not you. You are diehard red and black. And I think I read that you guys have been season ticket holders since you were really, really young. There you go. There's my, that's, that's, about my, as, that's about as personalized as it gets, actually. So tell me about Georgia football growing up. Dude, it was, uh, it was the biggest thing in my life. I mean, st- I mean honestly, it still is. You know, um, my dad went to school there. Um, my grandfather has season tickets. Uh, my dad still has season tickets. And I grew up that, you know, kids looked forward to Saturday because they could sleep in and play video games. But we did not do that in the fall. We were up at six o'clock in the morning, loading up the truck and we were heading to Athens. And um, I, dude, I, I wish I had kept every ticket stub because I, surely I think my counter's gotta be at about 115, 120 home games. And it's just, I just, it was like such a way of life. Like, I mean, like, you know, dude, it, it's a religion down there is it, it, Georgia football. So. It's, I, I've seen some of the worst heartbreaks. I've seen some of the greatest triumphs in Sanford Stadium, and I wouldn't trade any of that for the world. What kind of, like in general, when you're growing up there and then you start transitioning into music becoming more of a career instead of just a hobby, you got to get on the road as much as you can. You got to play as many dates as you can. But yet your life and your passion in the back of your mind still revolves around Saturdays in the fall. Was there a first time that you ever looked at a touring schedule and said, oh, man, we're going to have a schedule conflict here. We play Florida that day. We play South Carolina that day. How do you deal with that? Dude, literally the first time that happened was in 2018. We were out on the road with Lanco, and that was the first year in my life that I did not go to a Georgia football game. In, in like 25 or 26 years, however old I was, that was the first time in my life I did not go to a football game. And it was the year after we made our national championship run. I went to like eight games that year. I mean, it was like insane. And, uh, you know, it just is what it is, man. It's a part, I mean, it's a part of growing up. And, and trust me, uh, the, the reality of having a responsibility that I got to go have a Jack and Coke and sing country songs. Trust me, I'm not going to complain about that, but every Saturday that we had a game, you know, we prayed it was a 3.30 game or a noon game so we could watch it. If it was a night game, we were a little SOL, I mean, because we'd be playing a show. But me and uh, Trip Howell and Jared Hampton from Lanco, they're big Georgia fans. Every single Saturday, we'd find the closest wing spot, whether it was, you know, wing stop or some local place, and we would go get a dozen wings and sit on the bus and watch the game. In fact, the Georgia-Florida game, we watched the whole game on their bus. And uh, you just got you to make time for it. It's like because at the end of the day, half of those experiences inspired why I wrote half my damn songs were things that happened in Athens, Georgia. So I'm like, dude, I, you got to make time for that. You got to make time to still enjoy those things in life. Travis Denning, do me a favor as we wrap up here. Regardless of what day people are watching this, tell folks not only about the new single, but the new EP and where in the world they need to go to get it. Absolutely, man. Um, after a few is my single, it's top five at radio, uh, which is just insane. It's the longest running song on Billboard country music chart history, which is crazy. Uh, and uh, Beer's Better Cold is available literally anywhere you get music. You can buy a, you know, a physical copy off my website, or you can just go stream it on Spotify, Apple, Pandora, Amazon, wherever you want. And uh, I think it'll hopefully get your head out of this covid quarantine mindset for a little bit and let you escape travis denning this was fun brother hopefully we get back to normal soon hopefully we have not only a tour this fall but football this fall as well we appreciate you joining us brother hey go dogs man appreciate you